Kia ora koutou katoa, namahi nui ke koutou, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today toward the end of what I hope has been a fruitful week of discussion, debate, and different perspectives. And it's all being delivered in formats that might be a little different to what we're used to. That's because in a few short months, our worlds were turned upside down. And while in many ways we're still in the middle of a tumultuous and changeable period in our history, now is the precise time that we should be asking ourselves, what next? So let me start first of all with a thank you to Paul and everyone who's been part of Vision Week, whether you've been speaking, contributing ideas, or simply listening. Because we are navigating new waters and we all have a role to play in what comes next. And it's that which I'd like to speak to you a little bit about today. But before I kick off, a quick reflection from me. In the midst of our response to COVID-19, somewhere in the middle of lockdown, I received a letter. Now, this in itself is not remarkable. With people having a bit more time on their hands, perhaps unsurprisingly, we got a bit more correspondence than usual. Now, I don't have a chance to read every single letter that comes my way, but I do make a point of reading all of the letters that come from children. For me, they're a bit of a guide on whether we're doing enough to look above the horizon, to think about not just the here and now, but the future. Children, they look at challenges differently. Homelessness makes absolutely no sense to a child. Why can't we just house everyone? Ignoring climate change is not an option when you're a child. Inaction is as good as telling them that it's their problem, not ours. And plastic, especially straws, are weapons of destruction in the eyes of turtle-loving children who put animals before convenience. These are the letters and words and hopes of children and while there may have been a brief change of topic for them during lockdown, these hopes haven't changed. But perhaps our approach should. And so it was one day while in the midst of a pile of letters from both children and adults that I read one that had a very simple phrase in it that stood out to me. It's a phrase that is common in the space of aid development and resilience. But in amongst COVID, letters from children and all the challenges we're facing, these three letters seemed perfectly timed. Build back better. There have been moments dotted through our history that have given us cause to stop and reset. Sometimes those moments have been taken, sometimes they have not. Now I would argue that this moment is different. It's not that one part of our system has collapsed, that there's been a technological disruption that caused us to rethink our modes of operation, that we've been faced with the reality that our rapid development is unsustainable and therefore threatens development in itself. It's that all of those things are happening at once. We aren't at a fork in a road. We're at a spaghetti junction. Multiple challenges are all colliding at one point in time. But rather than careering down the road, we've had to stop. We've been forced to reset. We've been given the opportunity to reassess where we are and where we're going and to rebuild better. So as we pause at this juncture, what are our priorities? The things that determine the road that we'll choose to travel. In many ways, we determine them with our response to COVID-19 itself. We chose to protect our people in order to protect our economy. We chose to live up to who we are and what we are known for, to safeguard our future. We chose our own path. And in my mind, that same approach needs to be taken as we move forward. Now, I know that our team of 5 million will have different views on what that should look like, and we should hear those. Unified does not mean uniform. But the unity we've shown through our collective health response to COVID must continue as we rebuild together. Our team can be greater than the sum of its parts by listening and learning from one another, by embracing ideas which may come from unusual or unexpected places, ideas which may have in the past seen fanciful or impossible, but which may now be the right solutions for the challenge we face. 
or ideas which may be so simple that have been staring us in the face all along unnoticed. To do this though, it's going to take a whole team effort and working together. But where do we begin? What does building back better look like? A good starting point would be to see this period as an opportunity to tackle the problems we know we already had. On the social side, despite good progress, too many children still go to school hungry. Too many still don't live in warm, dry homes. And too many are still struggling with mental health issues on their own without support. Economically, we know we need to do more to raise productivity, diversify our economy, keep shifting from volume to value, and seize the opportunities that will arise as we come out from the shadow of COVID-19 safer and stronger than many of our international competitors. In September 2018, I set out our government's long-term priorities for the future, which would guide us beyond the day-to-day -day and the month-to-month, -month. priorities which would go beyond a single three-year political term and instead look to 10, 20, even 30 years ahead. I refer back to that plan often. Every decision we make as a government fits within one of the three umbrella areas. Building an economy which is growing and working for all of us and that includes ensuring it is clean, green and carbon neutral. Improving the well-being of New Zealanders and their families and making New Zealand proud. Whether that's the work we do to tell our own story and history or the work we do on the world stage. And in the aftermath of COVID-19, in the midst of our rebuild effort, these three priorities remain as important as ever. They are the destination we're seeking to reach as we navigate the spaghetti junction of this moment in time. In fact, if anything, this is the time and opportunity to speed things up. You will have heard us talk several times before about our economic plan to deal with the global impact of COVID-19. It's been based on the different needs at each stage, starting with the initial phase where a quick and definitive response was required. Here, we sought to cushion the blow of COVID by providing a wage subsidy to support businesses and their workers, even before we went into lockdown. It's also included tax changes to assist with cash flow and increase financial support to those on the lowest incomes. The second stage has all been about recovery and providing ongoing support as we move out of the lockdown, for instance. That's included things like an extended wage subsidy scheme and sector support packages for tourism, sports and the creative sector have all been taking a heavy blow from COVID. But that brings me to that next stage of our plan, the rebuild. Here we've already set aside investment to start support job creation and growth by addressing our infrastructure deficit, building more public houses for instance, dealing with long-term issues like pest eradication and water quality through our Jobs for Nature Fund, and finally dealing with our skill shortages by making all apprenticeships free. This is the time to accelerate the solutions to the problems we already had. It's the time to build back better. But it's also a time for ideas and collaboration, which is why our team and government is doing what we can to draw together the best ideas from the best brains to implement the best solutions to these problems. And that's why I was so keen to speak with all of you today. We all have a vested interest in New Zealand coming out of these times better than before. This is our home. It's where we live, work and play. It's where our friends are and it's where we raise our children. And those children write letters. So I'm going to ask something of you now, but I don't want it to be all give and take and no give. So after my request, I'm going to offer something back. My request to all of you who have taken part over this last week is to please don't let this be the beginning and the end of your contribution. Keep doing what you're doing. Don't stop coming up with ideas. Don't stop providing your perspective and drawing on your experiences. Keep telling us what you think we should be doing and let us know when we're getting decisions right and when we're getting them wrong, whether directly through government mechanisms, whether it's through the media, whether it's through initiatives like Vision Week or even by social media. Please be a part of the conversation. And my promise in return is this, that we're listening, that we will continue to do so and that we will take action on the basis of what we hear. Earlier this week, I know you discussed the fact that no one has all the answers, that building back better is going to take a whole team effort, and I agree. It took our team of five billion to 
beat this virus and it will keep taking our team of 5 million to beat the virus. It will take that same team effort to rebuild from its effects. Which is why next week I'll be announcing a more formal process for us to pick up what you have been doing as part of Vision Week, to keep drawing together our shared experience and insight and enable us to build back New Zealand even better. I'm immensely proud of how we've collectively come together over the last few months with common cause. And while I know we have a long, tough road ahead of us, I know what we are capable of achieving together in the future. I thank you once again for inviting me to speak today. Please keep up the conversation. And if you ever feel compelled, please, by all means, write to me too. It could make all the difference. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa.